on the reality. This is the reality. The reality is this is a war. These people are waging war on us for, for, for time. This has gone on for 1,400 years. This is nothing new. And the whole time while this goes, goes on, police leaders or political leaders want to invite more. They want to invite more. Thank you very much. The blood much. is on the hands just, of people like you and the left who have allowed these people to come into our country and cause chaos. There are going to be knocks on the door of families tonight We've saying that their daughters, the their mothers the and, their do and their family have probably been maimed and killed in the streets of our own capital and the left have allowed it to go unnoticed. And we have people like this laughing hysterically. Is this really a time to laugh? There's a fucking terrorist attack. There's a fucking... Because it's so shocking that you would laugh at something like this. This is a terrorist attack. This is... And this country has been fucked by people like this who think it's hilarious. Now, anybody who criticizes Islam is some fucking scummy, lower class, fucking racist. These people who speak out against this are the ones who are trying to prevent it. And every single one of you who thinks this is funny, the blood is on your fucking hands. For timing, timing at fucking turning a blind eye to all. That's 450 terrorists that you know about that you've let come back and walk our streets with us. They walk their streets, they, they queue up next to me in the bank in Luton. They live where we live. And they're loud back. And then everyone acts like their head on their hand. Why has this happened? Why has this happened? This happened because you let it happen. This happened because your government cowardice. Because of the politicians and because of the media who play your part as well. By hiding the truth about it. The truth is Islam is at war. The truth is Islam is a fascist, violent ideology which incites murder in 110 verses in the Quran. That's the truth. Tommy Robinson, I was founder of the English Defence League and I've spent the last 10 years opposing and highlighting the problems that Islam brings us. Cool. Yesterday we saw a terrorist attack in London. What type of attack did we see yesterday? Yesterday's terrorist attack was a, an Islamic Jihad attack. What the government and politicians will tell us was a lone wolf attack. Although these lone wolf attacks are carried out across the globe on a daily basis from the same people following the same instruction manual. Cool. In a nutshell, what are your main issues with Islam? In a nutshell, my main issues with Islam, fundamentally, if we go through the, the problems that come from Islam in, in our communities, last year 5,700 young British girls had their genitals cut off in the name of Islam. Um, if we look at sexual exploitation, Muhammad said, outside of Muslims' four wives, they can take non-Muslim women as sexual slaves. This is, this is quoted time and time again in the Quran, which is why we see Boko Haram, ISIS, all these different organisations across the globe taking non-Muslim women as sexual slaves and selling them. I see a problem with paedophilia in Islam. I see a problem that they view Muhammad as the perfect, perfect being. He, nothing he did, ever did was wrong. And when you read into Muhammad's life and you study Muhammad and you find out that he was 56 years old when he married a six-year-old child and she still had a doll with her and after beating her up, he then raped her when she was age nine. I have a huge problem with that, a massive problem with that. So fundamentally reading the core teachings of, of Muhammad and was he a moral man? No, he wasn't. He was a barbarian. Okay? He was a slave owner. He was a pirate. He was a robber. He tortured, I read the life of Muhammad, he tortured one man called Kanana. He tortured him for his gold. He executed seven, seven poets. Poets, yeah? There is no free speech in Islam. I believe in free speech. There's no free speech. You're not allowed to criticize Muhammad. If you criticize Muhammad, you have to be killed. That's a punishment in Islam. Um, so not just that, if you, and then one of the, the, the less things that in, in, the, in the problem when I read it is jihad, which is terrorism. Which is terrorism we see being committed across the globe on a daily basis against our people. Um, so when people say, what's my problem with Islam? And, it's not coming from the ignorant issue. I've read, I've studied, I've learned it. I know it inside out. I know the Quran better than most Muslims know the Quran. That's the reality of it. So yeah, I have a, I have a huge problem with them. Um, I have a huge problem with fascism. Fascism that teaches all of its followers that they are superior to other people and that other people are automatically going to burn in hellfire and that other people are like apes and pigs, as it said in the Quran. We, it, it quotes in the Quran time after time again that we're cattle. We're cattle. We're animals as non-Muslims. But most British people that are watching this, and probably any, any sort of Western people watching this, will say, well, I work with Muslims, and that's not really what I see. Yeah. So what makes you think that Muslims 
do you see people that are non-Muslims as different to them? Well, I'm, I, I'm not talking about Muslims. I'm talking about Islam. When people say, what's my problem with Islam? They don't say, what's your problem with Muslims? Individually, Muslims, if I quote Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill said Muslims will show amazing individual traits, but their ability to fur go forward as a society will be held back. Islam will drag them back. Yeah? I, I see the same. I see brilliant individual Muslims my whole life. Some of the best people I've met in my life are Muslims. But that doesn't mean they're following the scripture or the teachings of Islam. Most Muslims don't go to mosque. Most Muslims don't follow the Quran. Most Muslims don't even know the Quran. That's the reality of it in the UK. So the agenda of Islam is what I have a problem with. The teachings of Islam is what I have a problem with. The Prophet Muhammad and his teachings and, the, and holding this man up on a pedestal to tell people where well, there's three, four million Muslims in our country to tell us that he was a peaceful man and that he was some sort of saviour when he was a barbar barbarian warlord. Um, the nonce of Arabia is, is a huge, huge problem for me. But talking about yesterday and this terrorist attack specifically, what does that have to do with Muhammad or the teachings of Muhammad? Um, so Mah Muhammad would have taught that the ultimate, the, the most easy way, no matter how bad your life has been, which is what we're, we'll probably find about this terrorist, yeah? we find it about most of them. We find that they've even been gay, many of them. Yeah? We find that they've been out drinking alcohol. We find that they've lived a very a life full of haram. Yeah? Haram and halal. Halal are the good deeds in Islam, haram, haram are the outlawed deeds. So, so no matter how halal their life has been, yeah, if they want to get to heaven, they just have to kill non-Muslims in, 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 in a holy jihad. Yeah? That's all they have to do, then they get to heaven. So it's an ultimate, it's, an easy, it's, it's, like, it's like an easy card out for Muslims who have behaved badly their whole life. And we'll see this time and time again with the terrorists that we find. They say, he wasn't a practicing Muslim. No, but because of the scripture in Islam, and he, he genuinely believes that he's going to go to eternal hellfire for the life he's lived. He sees going and running down 20 or 40 people and killing coppers and killing, killing innocent people. He sees that as a get out because of the scripture in Islam. That's why. So during your time with the EDL, what do you feel like you said that opposed or petitioned this type of issue? So during my time with the English Defence League, you have to... Look, it's, it's frustrating for me, and a lot of people have seen on camera when I was arguing with the journalists, just, I get angry about this, I get passionate about it. I get passionate about it because a year before Lee, Michael Adelbalajo beheaded Lee Rigby in the streets of our capital, I, I made a video showing who he was, showing who his killer was. Yeah? We tried to highlight this. Time, Al Mujahideen, who are now a terrorist organisation, who and Jim Chowdhury and all these supporters, 60% of the people in prison for terrorism are ex-members of his organisation. When we started, they weren't a prescribed terrorist organisation. They got prescribed because of us. They were being left to do what they want. They were being left to promote hatred. Look at Omar, look at Abu Hamza outside the Finsbury Park Mosque. No one was challenging them. Bring, bring that time back and have the English Defence League, the, the, the authorities and the government would have dealt with him a lot quicker. So if, if you look at that incident, I just feel that we've, we've, we've highlighted these issues for so long. We've tried to confront these problems for so long. And the whole way through it, I get, caught, I get slandered, I get attacked, I get violently attacked. I've got people now often saying they're gonna kill me again. Um, and child exploitation, uh, sexual grooming, which we now call grooming in the UK. That's the rape and prostitution of a generation of our young kids. Yeah? In Rotherham alone, there was 1,400 victims. When you look at the stats around this, again, I know, I know people don't like facts, but they're facts. Yeah? Street gang grooming, not paedophilia. The majority of paedophiles in the UK are white, lone operative paedophiles. Yeah? As you'd expect from a 90% white country. But when you get street gang grooming in, in large numbers, where they're all, the, all the perpetrators know each other, they're related, they're cousins, they're work colleagues. 90% of the convictions of that are Muslim. 90%. Out of a population of 4%. And 20% of them are called Muhammad. There is a correlation between sexual exploitation and rape and Islam. There is a correlation between terrorism and Islam. I wish there wasn't. There is. That's the reality of it. The reality of it is yesterday when we saw this attack in London, which now we have to think about what's happened. We've got a dead police officer. We've got a mother of two on her way to collect their kids who's been mowed down and murdered. All of these things, this was a year anniversary from Brussels. There was 12 attacks planned last year. 12 terrorist attacks planned. People think, oh look, it's only, it's, it's only a small number. No, it's not. Do you know, I looked last night, because you know, I, I quoted 55,000 times. So Al Qaeda's magazine called Inspire, that they released for all of their followers and supporters to download to understand terrorism and what, how to kill us and attack us. 55,000 downloads in three months in the UK. 4,000 downloads a week of a terrorist manual by Muslims in the UK. And we're told it's not a problem. To, to me, to me, that's 55,000 people in three months who need to be booted and deported from our country.
Okay, not wait for them to do it. Not wait for them to get a car. Not wait for them to slip the security services. And when I, when, when I criticise the police, which I do, I criticise the police. I'm not criticising your average police officer. You look at the bravery of them yesterday on the streets of London. I'm not criticising them. I, they have to deal firsthand with this problem. I'm criticising their hierarchy. I'm criticising the political policing that's going on. I'm criticising the leader of Scotland Yard who came out yesterday straight after the attack and said, well, we want to assure the Muslim community we're with you, we're with you, we're with you. And the Muslim community must feel scared. No, police officers' wives feel scared. Okay, that's who feels scared because police officers are targets. Military personnel are targets. Every time they're probably walking into their barracks and they hear a car, probably look over their shoulder. Yeah? They're scared. Stop painting the victims of this somehow the Muslim community because no one's driving cars over them, no one's cutting their heads off. All right? that's, that's happening to us. So, the last terrorist attack we saw in the UK was from a far-right extremist, possibly even someone who aligns himself with your views or has previously been a member of organisations like the EDL. Why is this different? This is different. Well, look, actually, no, this isn't different. I mean, it's not, it's the same. On that day, two children lost their mum and a husband lost his wife. Yeah? who was murdered horrifically because of someone's political view. So it's not actually different. You know? I'll just say we have to put things into context. If you've got 300 planned Muslim jihad attacks against the equivalent of one on the opposite side, yeah, then that doesn't mean we should ignore, ignore this one. We shouldn't. But the amount of media and the amount of attention and all the focus on this one compared to these ones that are going on every single day and week that's what we, we need to look at the biggest threat to us in the UK. The biggest threat to us in the UK is not far-right extremism. We're quite blessed in the UK that we don't really have a far-right. As much as the media want to pretend we do, we don't. What we, what we actually have is ordinary people who are criticising with facts and statistics and then labelled as far-right. That's the reality. Some European countries, Eastern Europe, have a genuine real far-right that people should be afraid of. But doesn't some of that contradict what you say, though, in, in that you've said before that during your time at the EDL, you've almost violently opposed the far right in this country. It, that doesn't contradict, I'm just saying we have to put it into context. So we're in our time with the EDL. Yeah, th and even now, there is, there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a far right element. But are they a threat in any way, level, or shape or form in comparison to the Islamic threat in our, in our country? No, they're not. That doesn't mean we should ignore them. We shouldn't. We need to keep our eyes on them. Yeah? But the problem is, you feed them. You're feeding them. When, when, you, when you refuse to deal with these problems, when you refuse to deal with Islamic extremism, when you refuse, when everyone sees what's happening and they see no light at the end of the tunnel, you leave it open to create monsters. Yeah, and I understand the point you're trying to make, but when you look at it in an abstract form, in the last 24 months, for example, two terror attacks, one of them's far right, <coughs> one of them's Islamic, and here you are sitting saying that <coughs> extremism isn't, isn't a threat or isn't comparable. No, no, what I'm saying it's not comparable because in the last 12 months there's been 12 planned jihad attacks. Out of those 12 planned attacks, shopping centres, football stadiums, nightclubs, if they'd have all gone off, then you'd, be, you'd have a fair assumption. To, but it's just our security services are that good, they stopped them. Attempted abductions on members of our, of our military. All of these things that, that have gone on, yeah? Mass, mass plans, every single... Terrorism offences go up 60% every year. They're not getting worse. They're not getting better. Yeah? It's getting worse. I think we had over 350 Muslims arrested last year on terrorism. If we look at what sort of problem we're in, four times as many Muslims went to fight for ISIS, British Muslims, British-born Muslims. Four times as many went to fight and join ISIS than joined the British military. Four times. That's not my fault. I haven't done that. All I'm doing is pointing out the facts of it. The facts are that we've allowed over 450 of those Muslims to come back into the UK. Now, I know that. I guess it's been widely reported, but I know that because the head of Bedfordshire Police come to see me and asked me not to, go and, not to go somewhere I was supposed to be going on a Friday night. And when I said why, he said, could my coordinates have been intercepted from, from a Syrian uh, account? And I said, so what? He said, don't you get it? They're back. F like, nearly 500 of them are back. I said, that's not my fault. I haven't let them back. I said, so I should start sacrificing my freedoms now of what I go and where I go and what I do because you've allowed 450 trained jihadist terrorists who have been to training camps, they've been beheading people and they've been raping and they're now walking our streets of our country. That's a reality. Is there anyone in this country that thinks that's acceptable? And when, when, when I talk about deporting people, why have we let them back? We should have revoked their citizenship. They've gone and sworn allegiance to a foreign, a foreign enemy. That's, what, that's all we had to do is revoke their passports. Don't let them back because they're going to be a threat to our country. Instead, what we have is reformist voice and, and Muslim leading voices saying we need to reintegrate them. Reintegrate them. They weren't integrated in the first place. How are you going to reintegrate terrorists who have been out beheading people? 
You're going to play with our, our safety. You've seen it yesterday. You're going to play with our lives. You're going to play with our kids' future. You're playing with our country. You're rolling the dice and gambling our country. And I'm sorry, I, I don't think we should be doing that. And that's just, and I, I may get a lot of hate aimed at me. I've had loads again since yesterday. I don't really care. I don't care. I know I'm right. I know morally I'm right. I know it's a righteous course that I'm fighting. And I know that history will remember me for that. That's it. People are showing pretty extreme anger towards you in the wake of this. Some people say you were provoking the situation by being in London under the scene yesterday. What would you say to them? That yesterday I was in London. I was right next to the scene when the incident happened. Um, I was actually down there making a video to warn the public about Islam, ironically enough, for Rebel Media. That's what I was there doing. Um, I went to the scene. You have to understand that, I, that I, I've warned about these things for over 10 years. It's, it's turned my life upside down. Destroyed my life. I've been falsely imprisoned. I've got terror threats. People with guns and bombs and suicide vests on the way to kill me. Uh, I live a, a very different life to uh, that I used to live before I started speaking about these issues. So when something like this happened, and I'm there in the area, I also don't believe the mainstream media at all. I don't believe them. That's the truth. I don't. So I went for myself to see what I'd hear, to hear from witnesses, to have a look. That's it. And all I found was a sniggering media, a sniggering liberal elite media. That's what I found. Who looked down upon anybody like me, for just for looking like the way I do and talking the way I do, for my accent, for my background, for my class. I'm viewed negatively anyway by them. So they don't want to hear hard truth and hard facts coming from someone like me. They have a problem with it. So we seem to have seen an increase in terror attacks in Europe over the last three years. Why do you think that is? We've seen over the last three years an influx. Uh, the ref what was called the refugee crisis, which is really is um, an Islamic invasion. And again, you can go down to the Prophet Muhammad did exactly the same. He left as a refugee. When he built up his numbers, he, he took over and massacred everybody. Yeah? But that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, we're seeing an Islamic influx of people with mindset and views of, from organisations, whether it be Al-Shabaab, whether it be... Um, whether it be Al Nusra from, whether it be Al Qaeda, whether it be ISIS, they're flooded into Europe. So of course we're going to see an increase in terrorism. We've also seen an increase in massive increase in Muslim numbers, a million in, into Germany alone. You have to look at the the views of these people that are coming. If you look at the views from Afghanistan, yeah, Afghanistan, Egypt, it's around ninety percent in both those countries of men that believe stoning women is the appropriate method for adultery. That's how many people believe that. It's upwards to 90% of people who believe people should be killed for apostasy. So the people we're importing, let's not pretend we're importing people from Iceland. <laughs> we're not. We're importing barbarians. Barbarians who have a different view on everything. Right and wrong in the UK is the complete opposite to right and wrong in Afghanistan. That's what we have to understand. We're bringing these people in. So of course we're going to see an increase in terrorism. Of when, course. when you say that, it sounds like you're painting a picture of all refugees or immigrants. No, look, look uh, refugees are, we can as a country be a, a great example. When I was 11, 12 years old, we had a boy called Amir who moved into my road. He was one of the first refugees to come. He, him, his sister and his mum, his dad was killed in Bosnia. They moved in with a family, Sonia and Ray, the Bishop family in my road. Yeah? They were all over the newspapers. He's a shining example, a great example, great career. In, uh, I was out of him for the last England football match. Yeah? He loves our country. He hasn't been indoctrinated. He moved up to our estate where there wasn't a mosque at the time. He, he, he moved up there. He didn't have a father bring him up under Islam. He's brought up very liberal. Yeah? That's a success story and that's a real refugee. A real refugee. A thou hundreds of thousands of men running through, smashing things up and raping women on their way. They're not refugees. They're an invading army into our country. So I'm not against giving genuine refugee status to people. In fact, I'm, I'm pro opening up the British Embassy in Saudi Arabia and letting every woman go into it and, and freeing them from a life of slavery. I'm pro that. I'm pro freedom. But let's, I'm not going to kid and pretend that these men invading our country are refugees because they're not. They've gone through 16 safe countries to get to the Britain. Look at what the chaos they're causing in, in, in Europe. So as far as your belief goes, you think that a lot of these attacks are directly linked to immigration? 100% these, these, these attacks are directly linked to immigration and directs currently now whether this immigrant whether, whether the, the, man, the man yesterday happened to be a British born radicalised Muslim I'm telling you now mark my words yeah? immigrants that have come in in this current influx 
will be perpetrating terrorism against the people of Europe. That's it. It's already happened. Four of the Paris attackers were refugees. Okay? But what are you... Welcomed, closed, housed, fed by our government and our people. And then they turn their swords on us. And what I hear quite a lot from, from the right's kind of rhetoric is that, yeah, similar views to yourself. Probably a lot of people in the country feel a similar view that we should stop immigration, etc. But what are you saying then, that we should just stop a lot of immigration? Surely we've got a duty to help genuine people. Yeah, we have a duty to help people. No, I don't we? we do have a duty to help people when you look at our foreign policy. Our foreign policy and the destruction we've caused in many of these Muslim countries, we do have a duty to help them. So what are you but I'm, what I'm, what I'm, I'm not saying that... Well, bringing them into our country is not helping us. It's not helping them and it's not helping us. You're creating the most divided and polarised society in the world. That's what you're causing. So I'm proposing that when I say a no-fly no zone, I mean with the, over Turkey, on the borders of Turkey, where refugees... We are already the biggest funder of aid to refugees over there. Yeah? We do our part. Okay? I'm not saying ignore them. I'm just saying don't bring them into our country. There's much better suited countries for these people. In Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, all the countries that don't take any. They refuse to take any because of their own national security. But then they'll pay for hundreds of mosques in the UK to, for these people to go to and be radicalised. That's the reality of what we're seeing. We're being taken for absolute mucks. So what I'm saying about immigration, I'd say end Islamic immigration, but with the refugee crisis, set up a no-fly zone on the border of Turkey and force Turkey, force these countries into doing it. Set up somewhere where everyone who needs safety can go so that these people are safe, temporarily safe, because their country's problems will have to be solved eventually. And we can't, all these people coming into our country, when their country's, when their country's better and their country's not at war, they're going to go back. They're not. That's why we don't need to be importing them into Europe. That's what I'm proposing, and help them in every way possible. But don't help them by destroying our countries. So, you seem to think you've highlighted a problem. What's the solution? Look, it, it's a hard solution, yeah? And a lot of people's feelings are going to get offended in solving the problem. But I'll tell you what the solution isn't, to keep adding to it. You don't keep adding to a problem that you can't already solve. Yeah? We have a population of 4% in the UK that's Muslim. What does everyone think it's going to be like when that gets to 20%? With a community that doubles in size every 10 years. Okay? More hatred, more extremism. We see by the polls and statistics that the numbers are getting, the numbers are getting more radical the younger they are. Yeah? I'm saying that we stop all Saudi, Iranian and Qatari money coming to the country. And people say, oh yeah, but we need it financially. I think you ask the average British person, they'd rather be le less financially well off than have the pollution and the poison imported into our country by those countries. Madrasas across this country are being funded by Saudi Arabia. A, a backward, barbarian mindset that views women as, as property, as slaves, that human rights atrocities on a daily basis and they're, they're propagating the schools in our country so that's what I'm proposing I'm proposing that we have a, a tough stance on, on extremism we close down we deport any, any foreign criminals that are Islamic any foreign criminals and terrorists or just terrorists any criminals anyway should be deported if they've got dual nationality they're a burden on our society the prison system I'm, I'm advising that rather than having a prison system where terrorists go into normal prisons with car thieves that's ludicrous these people are prisoners of war. We have a worldwide war going on. Once you accept that, you might start dealing with it. Okay? They should be in prisoners of war camps. That's what they should be in. They should be in prisons that are set up for prisoners of war. Okay? Not, not, not sitting there radicalising and recruiting. And they should only be released at a time when the war is over. Only be released. Because as we've seen with Guantanamo Bay, out of those released, many of them, I think it's like 30% of them, have gone back to the battlefield. Yeah? They're killing again. It's like every, all the terrorists that come out of the UK prisons, we know they're getting more radicalised. We know we found terrorists who are plant, uh, put in prison for terrorism have been found with terrorist manuals in their cells. We know the problem. I've just had a message here from a prison officer who's an ex-armed ex forces who says that when the attack happened yesterday, all the Muslims in jail were cheering, clapping and applauding. You have to break that. You have to break it so that innocent Muslims going into the prison system are not being further radicalised. And least of all the weak and vulnerable white and black prisoners which are, who, are the, the, who are converted. There's so much we could be doing as a society to try and address this issue. But we're not doing any of it. Because to do it, we have to admit the problem. We have to admit what's driving the problem. We have to ask ourselves why 90% of imams in the UK prison system are Diabandi. Diabandi is the most conservative, strict and radical form of Islam in the world. 90% yeah? of the imams are Diabandi. What's all that about? 
We're actually allowing it. We're actually facilitating. 90% of imams in the UK can't speak English. When you, when you look at the Islam we have in Saudi Arabia, the Islam we have in Afghanistan, the Islam we have in Pakistan, it's no different to the Islam we have in the UK. I don't know why people think it's going to change. It's the same book and it's the same preachers. As I said, 90% of the imams in the UK can't speak English. They're coming from faraway caves in, in Afghanistan and promoting their intolerance on the streets and in mosques across our country. Yeah, and this is something that you said before, and I've seen you say before that taking somebody out of Syria doesn't change their views on Islam. And even this morning, I've seen Katie Hopkins <coughs> say that there's big cultural divisions in London between members of the Islamic community. But surely there's a big differentiation between people in Syria, people in Afghanistan, <coughs> people in Iraq, and British Muslims. Look, if we look at, if we look at the incident of the Paris attacks, where the main wanted terrorist fled to Mon Monambik, where he was from, yeah, he was the most wanted man in the world for three months. He was walking around the streets of his home estate. Yeah? No one grasped him. No one told him. Do you know why that is? When you look at British statistics, British polls from the, wider, from the, the mainstream Muslim community, 66% of those polled said they would not report another Muslim if he was fighting for ISIS. 66%. Put that in your head. Think about that. The British public need to really think about that. We're talking about three, four million Muslims in our country. We're talking about two million of them, at least, that would not report. So why could he walk freely around his home estate as the most wanted man in the world? Because they won't report on him because he's a fellow Muslim. And that comes down to the scripture, because the scripture says they can't side with the non-Muslim kafar over the Muslim, otherwise they go to hellfire. All of these things come back to the teachings of Islam. And 23% of British Muslims, in the same poll which was actually done by Trevor Phillips, who was the head of equalities, who was the man who termed the phase Islamophobia in the UK, yeah. It was a shock to him when he found out actually what the British Muslim community think. 23% of them want, want Sharia law in the UK. It's well over, that's nearly 800,000 Muslims want Sharia law in the UK. And they'll fight for it, violently. 4% believe suicide bombers are justified. 4%. 200,000 Muslims in the UK. 200,000. We need to understand these, these, these demographics. We need to really get a grip of it. Because as these numbers quadruple and the communities get bigger, these problems get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then currently, I think we're, we're costing over £9 billion a year monitoring these would-be jihadists that are numbered between uh, approximately 3,500. It takes a team of nine men to monitor each one. Yeah? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, what happens in 10 years' time when that 3,500 men is 35,000 men? I'm not scaremongering. It's reality. It goes up 60% a year. Yeah? It's probably going to be worse than that. What happens? What happens in Britain? What happens in France? What happens in Europe? What happens? That's our kids. That's our kids' future that we're just rolling a dice and playing with. And that's why if you see me get angry and frustrated and you can see me get wound up, it's because I've thought in depth about all these things, constantly thinking about them. I'm constantly thinking about them. And I know when my kids come in, I know that whatever happens in the future, I'll look in my kids' eyes and say, kids, I did everything I could. I did everything as an able man that I could. And there's plenty of people that are not doing everything they can. And those people are usually people paid and employed to do something. Police leaders, politicians, it's your jobs. It's not our jobs, it's not my job, it's your job. You're the ones paid, you're the one with the security to take this problem on, but you're cowards. But people will argue that clearly they are doing that job. Like you said, you've mentioned quite a high number of terrorist attacks that have been stopped. Yeah, ter ter look, ter terrorism is the least, I, I think, is, is a small part of the problem. When you look at these views, whether it be that 50% of British Muslims think homosexuality should be illegal, yeah. We have come forward so far in women's rights, in gay people's rights, in all people's rights, not to just go bring them all back to the Stone Age and the Dark Age, yeah. which is what will happen with an ever-increasing Islamic community. It's what's happened in Luton, in East London, in Birmingham. It's what's happening. So I say, like, it's not just terrorism. I'm not just on about terrorism. I'm on about the mindset, the viewpoint, freedom of religion. Non -Muslim, Muslims who want to leave Islam in the UK are persecuted. They persecute their target. There's no help for them. There's no help for them in a similar fashion to someone who's persecuted because of their beliefs. There's no help for them. Everything that comes down to the Islamic community is a taboo subject, whether it be allowing them to gang rape young white girls for decades in the UK, whether it be allowing them to cut off their daughter's genitals across the UK, whether it be allowing them to punish apostates and drive them into fear so that there are many Muslims now who will be watching this in the UK who do not believe a word of Islam, but they're not free to say that. This is Britain 2017. Since yesterday, there's been fierce opposition from Muslims who have totally condemned this attack. What do you think about that? Look, 
As I said after Lee Rigby was killed in my first speech, if you abuse a Muslim woman walking down the street, you're a coward. If you attack a mosque, you're a coward, you're a moron. Yeah? There's no justification for innocent Muslims being targeted over anything like this. Yeah? But that should not deter us from trying to stop Islam and trying to limit the, the power Islam has in the UK. That shouldn't stop us. I don't care if people's feelings get offended. I don't. I speak up all the time against any um, cowardly attacks against innocent Muslims. You have to remember that the majority of British Muslims would be fed up with what's happened. They'll be angered and frustrated just like we are. That's the reality. Yeah. But there's also a large proportion who are very sympathetic, who will be happy, who will be wishing for more attacks. Now, to deal with the two, I don't really, I don't care if people's feelings get offended. I'm, I'm offended on a daily basis. The British public are offended on a daily basis. Our country's offended on a daily basis with regards to Islam. So I don't think we should be worried about that to try and tackle the issue. Um, in, when I was ranting yesterday at those journalists, I said clearly, which you can dig it up and say, this will be a British born Muslim who would have been radicalized on the streets of the UK and our security service would have known who he is and they've let it happen. Breaking news now. That's exactly who it was. And yeah, that's my point entirely, is that. So on that point, obviously it's now just come out, but this guy was British born. A lot of what we've spoken about is immigration, Islam, Islam from other countries. Why is that significant, do you think, he was British born? It's significant he's British born because we've got, across our country, every single system is infiltrated. Um, prisons, education, schools being taken over in Birmingham, radicalised. Uh, universities. Do you know how many uh, terrorists, British terrorists, were ex-members of university Islamic societies? It's insane. It's insane. No joke. Look into it. <laughs> Look into it. The first, the first bomb of British bomb, bomb in Tel Aviv. Remember, is the Islamic society. The two doctors who drove the car into Glasgow Airport. Remember, their Islamic society. I mean, I mean, like it doesn't stop. It, every time you find a terrorist, you find that they've been radicalised at university. Yeah. All of these things, we need to clamp down all of it. And I'm sorry, prevent, which the Muslims moan about and kick off about, it's too weak anyway. It's too weak anyway. You're not even dealing with it. You're politically, you're trying to be politically correct when trying to tackle terrorism. That's what you're doing. You just need to get your gloves off. Get, get in there and, and, and smash this problem, metaphorically. Or let me out. <laughs> well, Sam, is there anything else that you want to add? It's funny that. Um, just that, out of this incident, my condolences completely go with the victims. You know? A police officer being murdered on the streets of the UK is the equivalent of a member of the military being murdered on the streets of the UK. I'm not saying it takes any superiority over the female victim or the male victim or any of the other victims. You know? What I wish is that four years ago when I sat here and made a video after Lee Rigby being beheaded and I warned and advised on things we should be doing, they haven't been implemented and we're in the same situation. I hope I'm not sitting here again in 12 months, in 6 months, in 4 years, saying exactly the same. We have to get to a point where these things are implemented. We have to, to save the country, to save our kids' futures. So that's why I don't get deterred. I know I'm right. I know what I'm saying is right. I don't care how many people don't like it. It's the truth. It's fact, it's what we're going to need to do. So all the things I'll be, look, 10 years ago, nine years ago, when I first started saying these things, people view me as an extremist. Six years on, seven years on, I'm sitting watching the same news presenters who had me on the radio belittling me and calling me a thug and an extremist are then saying what I said. Yeah? So I've watched the whole politically, the, everything shift to, for people coming along to realise, and actually, this guy was, he understands it. And he was talking sense. And the reason why I understand it, I was talking sense is because I'm born in Luton Town. I've been brought up around it. All these people going to fight for ISIS, all, all the radical terrorists in jail. I grew up with them all. Yeah, and one thing that I heard you say before was that there's two types of people, those that have been affected by Islam and those that are going to be affected by Islam. Yeah. Does so that still stand? It still stands, yeah. Once you're affected by Islam, you'll then wake up knowing. Once you, so a lot of the people, you have to understand these people who criticise me, they live in leafy suburbs. They don't understand what I'm talking about. They don't get it. They think all cultures are equal. Everyone's equal. Everyone's the same. No, they're not got news for you. They've got news for you. Islam's very, very different. Very different. The hostility, the hate, the violence, it's a whole new ball game that we've ever dealt with. And it's here. 